what people say. Yeah, I think um, the industry has changed so much where um, there's not really much money to make, be made on record sales anymore. It's like all in shows and um, well, I was gonna say merchandise a little bit too, but you know most labels are doing like 360 deals where they they uh, share in the income of the shows, and we haven't really done that. But it's at the point now I think where we might have to because. That's, you know, it's just like one of those sad realities. So what does that mean you said 360? Um, 360 is kind of when you're in a partnership with the artist and then you're, you're kind of sharing the income on all the different income streams together. So is it mainly the record sales that's hurting, like maybe the indie label industry? Yeah, I mean, it's, well, there's no physical product being sold really anymore. I mean, there's a little bit of, um, a little bit of vinyl. I mean, a lot of times we don't even press CDs on artists anymore. And CDs used to be like the majority of um, where the money was coming in, you know, mm -hmm. in like the 90s and 2000s. Um... I mean, a lot of times we will put out a, a record with an artist and then either either the label or the artist is unhappy with the sales and then, you know, we go our own ways. It happens a lot. And then sometimes we've had a couple artists where we did a, you know, we did well with them, but we can only take it so far. And then uh, major labels came in and made offers and we worked stuff out with the major label. So that kind of works out for both the artist and the stones throw as well when that happens. And yeah, Mayor Hawthorne, that happened with Mayor, and then it, it also happened with Aloe Black, so. Um, I mean, really, it was, we just kind of spent time in record stores more than, you know, hanging out anywhere else. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of my memories of him were in the hospital, you know, or like, I remember he called me from the hospital and, and he said he was coming home and he asked me to, to pick him up, you know, and I remember him being in the wheelchair and taking him to his house and stuff, you know, and that was like, that was a really good feeling to, to see him leaving the hospital, you know, instead of going into the hospital, like a lot of times, yeah, he was just always in and out of it, so... But, um, you know, going to Europe with him, that was a good time. And, um, New York, we did some shows out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did a, when, when Jaleb and Mad Villain came out, we, we did a few sh shows in the U.S. and Canada. And it was just, it was cool to have Della, Mad Lib, and Doom, and then J-Rock and myself, like, were kind of the openers, but... Having those three all like on a bell together, that was like the first and last time that ever happened, you know? <coughs> well, there were a lot of groups before I, before I meeting Adlib, there were a lot of groups from the Bay Area that I liked. Yeah. That didn't have a label, like the Homeless Derelicts, there's this rapper Encore. Um, Rasco, I put out you know a single and then eventually an album with Rasco. So, and then when I met Madlib, you know, just hearing the loop pack and then hearing Quasimodo, I just kind of changed things for me. I think. Yeah. And for Stone's Throw, and then I moved to LA because of Madlib. But yeah, I mean, did you you move to LA to be like closer to? I moved to, to LA, live? yeah, because Madlib he never answered his phone. <laughs> he didn't. Um, he didn't have email. He still doesn't. Actually, no, I think he does have email now, but mm. I usually don't email him, I just deal with him through texting and stuff. Oh, okay. But, um... So he's always been, like, pretty reclusive? Or? Yeah, super, I mean, more so now, but yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is, it, is it because of Urban Dictionary? <laughs> oh, no, no, I don't care about that. No, Peanut Butter Wolf. Um, I was in a band, and I'll be actually going back further than that. 
my ex-girlfriend's little brother was telling us about the peanut butter wolf. It was like this made up character that he had in his mind or something. <laughs> and I thought it was really weird. And so I told my friends and we had a band and then we started singing about the peanut butter wolf. Like in every song we were talking about the peanut butter wolf. And so then we called the band peanut butter wolf. And then I showed the, those recordings to Charisma and Charisma said, oh, you should make that your DJ name. So. But you didn't want to, but you did anyway? No, I did at the time, yeah. I thought that it was crazy and that nobody in hip hop was, you know, being that outlandish or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then it just got, I don't know, it's too much. Oh, they just contacted us and wanted, they liked our music and wanted it in their TV shows. And I'd never even heard of Adult Swim at the time. Really? <laughs> yeah, I was just like, oh, okay. Gosh, yeah, it sounds good. And then that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it really it helped us because everyone who watches Adult Swim is pretty much open-minded, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they hear the people who, yeah, who would probably like Stone Star if they heard it but didn't know about it. So. Don't ever let what people say. No, there's. I mean, we definitely still get hit for samples and. Yeah, we've got we've gotten nicked a few times, definitely. Yeah, do, do you notice like is it like a certain number like you know that if you There's sell no rhyme or reason? Mm. We've gotten hit on stuff that's super obscure, and then I mean we put out things that have done really well that or we haven't gotten hit so. <laughs> I got asked to DJ a, a night of all tapes, and they, they didn't tell me this until I got there, but the tape decks that they had had pitch control, so you can actually, like, cue up the intro to it, and then, like, stop it, like, right on the one, and then, I mean, a lot of pause buttons are, like, they have a delay, so, so it's hard, like, I mean, for me, like, even before I was, before I had turntables, I would make pause mix tapes, and a, a lot of people... Yeah, I remember those. My age, you were doing I remember that. Those. Like, I remember those. You know, you'd like take, yeah, you so you try to pause it and unpause it on beat. But <laughs> if there's a delay, then it, it's uh, a lot harder to get it on beat. But, anyways, so long story short, um, yeah, these tape decks <coughs> had a good pause and um, pitch control. So you can actually, you can mix, but it's not as, well, wow, Dig Dug, what the heck is that? And Berserk. All right, those are all video games, weird. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not as easy or precise as turntables, but it's kind of cool when you get it on beat. It's been, um, I've been DJing, like, actually that tour with Dilla and Madlib is, and, and Doom was the first time I really started DJing because I knew like if I was going to share the bill with those guys, I was going to have to bring my own thing to the table that no one else has done. So. Mm -hmm. But back then I was using these um, DVDJs, like these, like the they're like CDJs, but you know, with DVDs, like video. Yeah. What do you use now? Now I just use Serato. But when I was doing that, I like spent like $8,000 on like the mixer and the, the DVDJs. And, and then Serato came out like a couple years later and it was like way easier. I'm like, damn it. Is it harder than DJing or about the same difficulty? No, it's a lot. I mean, I, I feel like in certain ways it's a lot harder because with, with DJing, um, when you're mixing from song to song, like a lot of times the audience doesn't catch it like in the beginning and it's easy to do it smooth but when you're like BJing like they see the, the visual right away and they like anticipate it and it's hard to explain but it's it's definitely like kind of awkward doing it doing the videos as opposed to just audio Don't ever let what people say. Oh. <laughs> no that was that was real <laughs> <laughs> which, cast, which cast? The first one? It was the San Francisco one. Oh, snap. I think there was a guy, Muhammad, that was on it. I mean, is it because you guys... Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't remember if that came through Hollywood Basics or what, but... We were supposed to be in, um... 
Sister Act also. Like Sister Act Part 2. <laughs> Why didn't you? I don't know. I just never, like, materialized. When we signed with Hollywood Basics, they, would, they were promising us a lot of things, you know. We, we were supposed to have a song. They were going to start getting our songs in a lot of movies, soundtracks, and stuff. And yeah, that how, seemed exciting to us at the time. But. How was it being on Hollywood Basic? That, like, wasn't like organized confusion and then like a couple of groups back in the day? Yeah, oh. organized were our label mates. Mm -hmm. And then um, there was this group, Raw Fusion, who was, it was Money B's group. And actually, Money B is how we got signed because he, he heard our demo and he really liked it and brought it to the label. But we actually toured with him, and I remember he was telling us about, he was like, man, yeah, there's this guy named Tupac that, like, is our hype man. He's so hard to keep under control at the shows and off stage. He's always getting in trouble. <laughs> I remember he was, yeah, he was telling us about him for, like, 